You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. So did you actually go 3-2 or 5-0 at your pre-release? <laughs> well, close enough. I went 3-0 because there's only three rounds. They, uh, they really, um, the pre-releases have become much more casual, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. It's just like, I remember That's in Monarch, we had like, uh, I don't know, I think it was five rounds with cuts to top eights with these like play mats for first that we was trying to get. Um, and nowadays, you just go, yeah, nowadays you just go in, hang out, do your three rounds, and go home. But I played at Reaper Game Store and they had pretty ridiculous pricing considering that the product is also delayed for, <laughs> until the first. There was uh, two pack. It was three packs for showing up and two packs per win. So I came out with eight packs. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was, a, it was a good time. I actually played Fi, unfortunately. I wanted to play anything except Fi, and then my deck, it was definitely a Fi deck. Um, but mm, next time. I played Dromai yesterday, and I got one more pre release today, but I played Dromai yesterday. My deck was good. Do you have a lot of Santa Pies? I didn't actually. No, I just had like a really strong, like kind of defensive deck with a couple of dragons in the end game and just good ways to to make Ash and turn Ash into Ash Wings. Just that's, took over games. That's the deck that I want to I want to play. That's the one I want to try. I just haven't really, I feel like I haven't gotten the pool, but maybe I should try to force it. I don't know. Yeah, well, pre-releases are more than underway. And with that, Uprising is releasing in a week. Unfortunately, in the US, it is going to be delayed by a week from release. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the news. And I have a couple of questions for you, actually, Brendan, because mm -hmm. I know that's going to impact you. Um, but in terms of where we are, well, we're coming into a new class constructor format. The sort of shakeup with two heroes going Living Legend, Star of the Show, and Chain plus the release of Uprising is really going to sort of be kind of the biggest change we've seen in the class constructed meta since the start of Flesh and Blood, really. New set plus two heroes rotating out is a, is a pretty big change. So today we are going to talk about Uprising's impact in class constructed. We're going to go through each of the three new heroes, talk about those, how to build them, sort of week one builds, what we're looking for and where we think they're going to kind of shake out in this Road to Nationals meta. Plus talk a little bit about the set and um, how it might impact the already existing heroes in the format. So before that, Brendan... I want to talk this week in Flesh and Blood, but I want us to go back a week because uh, we are recording this early. It's actually the weekend of the Pro Tour. Uh, sorry, weekend of the Pro Tour. Weekend of the pre-release because you are heading off on a, on a trip, so we are doing an early record. We've been playing pre-releases this weekend, um, but also last week we did the set review and we didn't cover a bit of a recap on our events, the world premiere and the calling. So this week in Flesh and Blood is actually last week in Flesh and Blood. And how was your time in Vegas, Brendan? It was good. <laughs> Vegas? Vegas itself? Hmm. Maybe not so good. It was the World Series of Poker weekend. So there's so many people. It was crazy. I've actually never seen so many people in one place. I went to the Bellagio one night and I was just blown away. But for the event, um, yeah, so my team was initially me, Sasha Markovic, and X. Um, X actually was pretty undeterred for a very long time. We have found uh, Mr. Sean Yang. And then Sasha had to dip out, unfortunately. So I got in contact with Michael Hamilton and convinced him to come over. So my team was Sean Yang, Michael Hamilton, and myself. I was on Kano, Sean was on Reinar, and Michael was on Oldham, of course. <clears throat> Overall, I think the event went pretty well. We did our seating like this. We did Reinar in seat A, Kano in seat B, Oldham on seat C. Um, turns out that if we had put the Reinar in the middle and put the Kano on A, we would have done significantly better um, because most teams in the United States put their old him in the middle which is pretty funny and i think this is something that we should dive into because it really helps you understand how the metagame shapes out because i think this is a facet of that the idea is that you probably shouldn't put your old time middle because they are preoccupied even though the deck might be easier to pilot whatever anybody wants to say Nevertheless, your old him, especially if it's in a mirror, is going to be urging the other old him to play faster, uh, has to play very grindy games, and will likely be preoccupied for the entire match. So putting them in the middle is kind of weird, right? Because they can't facilitate player A or C, theoretically. But I think what happened was that old him was sort of the de facto best deck in the, in the format, right? And I think a lot of teams put their best player on the best deck, and that just happened to put that player mid. I, it was overwhelmingly old him middle, which was fine for Kano. It was fine for our Kano, but our Reinar <laughs> unfortunately got paired into mostly aggro decks. Uh, a lot of Kasai, um, a lot of Chain, just stuff like that. 
which is less ideal. I think if we had Arcano up against that, you know, Kasai basically being a buy for Kano, um, Reiner obviously being pretty strong into the old hymns. I think Kano is as well, but it, we would have we basically would have been positioned to perform a lot better. Nevertheless, we went uh, X two and one on day one, so we had two losses and then we had a draw. Unfortunately, so we missed out on day two, but all good overall. Had a great event. Uh, it was cool to see in the finals. Um, Michael Fang, Yongji, and Yongji were in the finals, and I think yeah, Yongji was playing with the sleeves with my face on it, which I thought was hilarious. We have a funny video of it uh, playing Kano. Actually, two Kanos in the U.S. finals. One being Alexander Vor's team. I think that mm. was, his brother was on that team as well, playing vastly different Kano builds. So like Yongji's build was different than mine on Kano, but he was playing Ragamuffins, and then Alexander's build was different than mine's, but he wasn't even playing Ragamuffins. He was playing Talismatic Lens. So we saw. You know, sort of this uh, different interpretations of Kano. Um, both teams, I believe, had an old him, and then there was a Michael Fang was on Prism, Prism in middle, right? So we, I told you a lot of old hymns were sitting in middle. Well, Michael Fang, you know, brought that Prism deck and just absolutely mm -hmm. was dunking on these on these old hymns. But yeah, overall great event, had an awesome time. The weekend itself was fantastic as well. World premiere, great time. Um, got to do a draft and stuff, and got to play some sealed some sealed pools uh, on uh, on Sunday after I didn't make it in day two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, World Premier was fantastic. I had the, the best time in terms of uh, my time over the weekend here in Sydney. Uh, I had some friends fly in. I had Dan Mackay, who we test with fly in, and, and Dave, who is our editor for our videos um, and good friend. He he also flew in, and um, we all went and played World Premier uh, and had a, had a good time just opening new cards. And I was just like... Some of the, like next to me, someone pulled like a, I think it was like the double-sided like token. I was like, people don't know about that and it's really cool. And then someone pulled like the um, the rewind and then the judge goes, um, the head judge goes, uh, so uh, there's a misprint in the set. <laughs> uh, you know, it's this like alt art foil rewind. And then he like, two minutes later was like, no, never mind. It's a, it's like, that's meant to be that way. It's a, it's a bit of a, you know, bit of an Easter egg. I guess kind of, it's a, it's a purposeful alt art card by Legend Story Studios, like the Full Art Twenty Blade, etc. So, um, that was pretty sweet. Had a, had a good time on Friday, uh, catching up with everyone, and then the calling itself. We, so we had just kind of to riff off what you had there, Brendan. We had a very similar. I mean, we played the same three heroes, but we played. I think our ultim was quite a bit different, or somewhat different to what what Michael ended up on. Um, and we, I guess in terms of like seeding, quite interesting, you just said like a lot of, like majority of the US teams, North American teams put their ultim in the middle. We kind of experienced that to some degree, like some teams put their ultim in the middle, um, but primarily the ultim players were sitting on the side, which is kind of what we thought would happen. And that's why we, we put our Reiner on the side and we put our ultim deck on the side as well. Our ultim deck was just kind of pretty disgusting into the mirror and to aggro decks. It was just this like ultra fatigue um deck that nick butcher played with just like a million life gain and like just good blue defense reactions even played like blue immovable heart of fiendal just all these ways to kind of gain life and grind games out um never went to time by the way nick never went to time or, or took a took a draw he just like made sure he just played as quickly as possible urged his opponent to make plays um so we, yeah we had nick in seat i guess seat a ours was weird they did these like banded color things which was kind Same. of a bit odd but uh, we had Nick in seat one, then we had Dan McKay in the middle playing Kano and then myself on the, the side playing Reiner, of course. Um, and so I think it worked out a little bit better for us than what you were saying in terms of just where the players were sat. Um, I think Dan had the hardest time in the middle uh, playing up against a, a lot of people put aggro decks in the middle thinking that people would, you know, put their ultims on the side. They decided to put their like their boost dash in the in the middle, um, Kano's in the middle. I know Dan, I think, played three Kano mirrors and, and won all of them. He even played against Jason Chung and won a Kano mirror. So he's, he's taking that as like his badge of honor now, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, we, we obviously had a, had a great time and uh, managed to take top four. We lost to, we played into the one of the Alice's teams in the final round of Swiss and in the first round of top four, which was uh, Newson's team. So Newson is former dev, now operations uh, for LSS. He's playing Ira and he's playing in my seat. So I got to play against Ira twice as Reiner. And uh, both the games were, the Swiss game was pretty epic. Like um, there's a lot of like 33% whiffs that I hit runner to runner. And uh, I think me and Newson were just having a good time like hitting these cards off the top. And there was a, there was a time in the, where like I had double reckless wing, double six attack in hand. And he like had lethal, like more than lethal on the turn. I just had to go for it. And just like hit the reckless swing off the other reckless swing and just things like that was actually ended up being quite fun and um yeah i mean overall just, just kind of an, an awesome weekend i just these world premiere events are so cool right like i hope they continue to do these and obviously i know that 
we're not, you know, down here in Australia, we're not going to get them every single time, um, maybe, but, you know, for them to continue to do these for each of the core sort of the base sets, I think is going to be a really cool thing. Um, and even that, that sort of that, you know, they were offering draft in the afternoon. I think that's a really cool thing as well. So I don't know, Brendan, I just hope they continue to do them. I think it's a cool spectacle. Tag a calling on, tag a team, call, team I want more team callings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, the Monarch world premiere, oh, yes, Tales of Aria world premiere was also fantastic. So I, I really do hope they have them every time. It's particularly cool to open the set when you don't know all the cards because, <laughs> you know, they actually don't spoil all of them before we finally get to open the packs. Obviously, opening the Marvels, like these special tokens, yeah. that stuff's really, really fun. But uh, yeah, Hayden, I'm a lot of Marvels look so good. <clears throat> they do. In, they did a very good job. They did a very good job. It is exciting to open Uprising, period. Uh, I think it's the, yeah, I mean, I think it's the best so far, right? The like, coolest set to open? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the coolest set to open. Yeah, I just had uh, one last one last thing on this. I just have to give a a, a few shout outs because we had uh, the event in Sydney was really interesting. I think it was like it's the biggest event that Australia's had, uh, and it was bigger than Madrid, which is interesting in terms of teams. So I think there was nearly a hundred teams in Sydney, and I think there was like eighty in Madrid. So it was a bigger event for the calling than Madrid would, which is is crazy to think. Um, but just the the head judge Noah. I mean, this is here's this. How's this, um, Brendan? They had eleven judges for like, nearly a hundred teams in uh in sydney in madrid they had four times the number of judges <laughs> so shout out to the judge team here in sydney they did an amazing job with very limited resources uh, and to know who was the head judge and um just the way it was run lss obviously some of the lss team members coming over and uh let's play games who actually run the event did a, did a good job um and the, the venue was like it was just kind of this like um it was like an auditorium it's quite a nice sort of venue nicer for playing than in a big sort of soulless hall which i, I like that they can do that with smaller events similar to what they do in europe i know with um the calling uh, that happens in Poland. Yeah. I just have to give one shout out as well to Mr. Hemlaw Patel. My favorite vendor sells me pretty much all of my cards, but also hooked us up with some cards to rent. Uh, <clears throat> lent us some cards on the day of because Mr. Michael Hamilton is the epitome of a spike and actually doesn't really own flesh and blood cards. <laughs> so we had to get a last minute heart of Fiendal and they had no problem just like <clears throat> letting us uh, borrow this for the day. So that was very helpful. And uh, thank you to Hemlaw. Good. Yeah, top guy. All right, Brennan, should we jump into some news? Let's now we've it. recapped our premier, uh, world premiere and callings. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, every time I come off a weekend like that, I just want to play more Flesh and Blood. I want to play more <clears throat> competitive events. I can't wait for Road to National season now just to play, just to explore this new constructor format. And um, yeah, I want more teams formats, just if, if anyone at LSS is listening. Uh, the news, Uprising drops this weekend. Unfortunately, Brendan, not in the US though. Um, do you have some little sort of insight on that from your side about what's kind of happening with that at all yeah, and, and what sure. that means? I know you've got an event coming up this weekend, which is meant to become like a big release. I think it's a 10K event <laughs> happening out somewhere. I think it might be a 15K total because the team, sure. okay. uh, the team event is a 5K on the Sunday as well. So I'm going to Ohio. Um, Cleveland, Ohio, to play at the Realm Games 10K um, event, and there's a team. There's now a team sealed on that Sunday as well. So this team event is class or sorry, the initial event, the 10K is class constructed, and now it is uh, due to the delay. Uprising will not be legal, but both Chain and Starvo will also not be legal. So we get to play our own little mini format, and I'm actually more excited for this than if Uprising was legal, because we're going to have plenty of time to play Uprising, right? We have plenty of time to play that CC format. We get one weekend to play a completely sort of new and just special format, and then just rotates out forever. <laughs> so I'm actually more excited, and the team, what was going to be Team Blitz, is now Team Sealed. So I'm pumped. That's uh, cool. Yeah, but overall, like, the sentiment over here, I don't know, I haven't heard too, I haven't heard a lot of, like, negative sentiment i don't really go online too much but at my local game store people are like yeah whatever they're bummed but uh it's whatever it happens at least like the good thing is that lss communicates right they're upfront yeah. they communicate it and um yeah they just let us know it's kind of a mistake on their end and we will get it by the first so a couple of questions for you because how do you feel about the fact that road to national starts the weekend now that because it was meant to be released and then you get one weekend before road, road to nationals right but now road to nationals starts the I have this right, yeah. Road National starts on the second, which is the weekend of release. How, how do you, how are players feeling about that? Like that, that is putting some time pressure on players being able to capture cards and things like that, right? Yeah, for class constructed, for sure. So for me, there's actually none really local that weekend. Um, so for CC, it's annoying. <laughs> it's definitely not ideal for class constructed. For something like draft, which a, a lot of these road to nationals are, 
um i think it's either equal or better right because you just get to have you get to have a fresh kind of a fresh uh a fresh draft format i guess it doesn't really affect anything in that sense but yeah for class constructed if there is a deck that is overwhelmingly powerful then it might be a bit irritating but at the same time like flesh and blood is a game where you know you don't really need to effectively buy into the new set to be competitive even at the highest level like sometimes there's going to be some outliers of cards that you will want to get um mm -hmm. but you can walk up to one of these events and bring your prism or bring your briar which i think are both going to be good picks in the upcoming meta and do well yep okay and then what about um i guess the event you're going to so are you playing the team seal and if so who, who are your teammates <laughs> yeah so i am playing the team sealed my uh my teammates are michael fang and yuanji um we yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. So I'm actually going up to New York on Monday and I'm going to be staying with Michael at his place in Jersey, which is cool. And then we're going to fly over to Cleveland together. So awesome weekend kind of coming up for me. Four team sealed. Really interesting. Really interesting because there's three heroes and you're playing you're playing the three heroes. Almost guaranteed you're playing three heroes. So the question is, is like, how do you distribute those cards? And like, I think sort of the 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 looming thing for me is like can we build a fatigue deck right can we have certain decks that can just get across the line with 30 cards maybe an icelander deck it's a little bit uh uninteractive you know it has a lot of arcane damage but then can we just have one deck that just dunks on everything because it just has way too many cards way too much life gain etc etc um it's gonna be interesting to sort of figure that out i have i've never played team sealed and particularly team sealed when there's like literally three heroes and there's three players yeah so i'm excited what I think the hardest thing is going to be actually is that you have to divide all cards into three. Mm -hmm. So you have to divide your sideboard cards as well. So you have to decide, you know, where mm -hmm. you're going to put the cards that are good into Icelander, for instance. Yep. Where you're going to put that extra piece of Quail. Where you're going to put that, um, you know, that piece of, uh, you know, that Oasis Respite, that Sigil, that Life Gain. Like, where are you putting that? And that's that's also, I think that's actually the toughest thing. Once you decide the three heroes, it's like, okay, well, actually, where are these cards that are a bit more specific for matchups? Where are these going? Because you can't swap them between decks. You've got to decide, lock it in. That's what you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to be doing a little bit of like theory crafting throughout this week, a little bit of learning on the day, but uh, everybody is. Nobody's played it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Nobody knows to exist. All right. Last last one on this is uh, got, got a bit of a hint. What, what deck are you thinking about playing in with this weird format that's only going to exist for one weekend only? So I think there's like three relevant picks, three like big ones, right? There's Old Him, there's Prism, and I think there's Briar. Um, I'm between uh, Prism and Briar. So it just depends what I think other people are going to pick, <laughs> to be honest, because I don't want to play Prism if it's going to be mono Briar, and I don't want to play Briar if it's going to be mono Old Him, because that's also a rough matchup. Maybe I'll lean towards the Prism, just because I have a lot of recent experience with that exact list, like the probably the list that would be successful in that format is similar to the one that was successful against Starvo, maybe cut some D-Reacts, stuff like that. Um, so probably lean more towards the Prism than the Briar, but those two, those are the toss-ups for me. Mm, can i make a suggestion yeah yeah go is it reinar <laughs> <laughs> no nah, it's dash what about dash what about dash um mm. so here's the logistics of my situation right i have tomorrow and then i'm flying out on monday and i will have no time to play throughout that week i'm gonna be very busy it's like a work trip for me so I don't think I can like bring back a deck that I haven't played since Crucible. It just seems a little sketchy. Could it be successful? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I mean, you got, you, what are the three decks you have to beat? You've got to be Prism, Briar, and Old Him. Sounds like Dash can mm -hmm. do all those, right? To an extent, you can definitely do two of them well, and then two maybe you well. hitch against the third one. But that's probably what I would, uh, I would take if I was in, in your, in your shoes. But obviously, I tested a lot with that deck for the Pro Tour. But anyway, best of, best of luck, Brendan. Mm -hmm, Enjoy. You, Sounds like it sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I had something like that for the first weekend, but I'll just have to wait another weekend for Road to Nationals. Anyway, moving through in the news, uh, calling Utrecht and Singapore tickets are on sale. I believe Singapore's actually sold out already, Brendan, which is, is crazy. Um, I know it is capped, I think, at, at 300 players, but I don't know if they're looking to extend that. Hopefully, they, they do to allow more players to come, um, but I guess that's going to be venue, venue dependent. And then more Battle Hardens have been announced. Uh, so we have uh, upcoming Battle Hardened events in, in Syracuse, which I think was already announced. Toronto, Los Angeles, uh, Auckland now as well, um, coming up on the horizon within this kind of next season. So I think these are all within July, I believe. Um, yeah, just looking at the dates now they are. So if you are in the areas or you're thinking about, you know, you're close by and thinking about going to them, check out fabtcg.com and you can see all the dates and, and uh, the 
the organizers and how to interact and there's links on all those. <clears throat> I want to give a big congratulations to the calling winners around the world. Uh, obviously, three callings this weekend. The most callings, the first time we've had uh, you know, multiple callings on a weekend, right, Brendan? So um, and some pretty impressive results, right? Like you talked about Alexander Devore's team winning, obviously coming off the back of a top eight at Pro yeah. Tour and then his team winning the, uh, the US calling. But then also in Madrid... Pro Tour champion Pablo Pintor uh, and his team took out a lot the calling, of consistent so. results. And the, Bol- yeah, the Bolton of- boys, Jack, I think the last time Jacob Pearson played a played a calling, he won as well. He won the calling exactly. So uh, <laughs> three three players who have put up a lot, you know, consistency starting to show through. I think that kind of talks to team format, to be honest. Um, a very good team. The, I mean, we we played against. I just I point out we beat the Bolton boys in Swiss. Mm. Uh, we we downed them, even though we had an auto loss with Prism playing to Alton. We just scooped that matchup immediately. It's pretty funny. We just scooped that matchup and basically we didn't scoop it, but Nick played it out. But he wasn't really focused on the game. What he was actually doing was remembering Dan's pitch deck for him. So that when Dan uh, pitch deck the combo against Jacob playing Ultim, uh, Dan killed him and Nick knew his, his exact uh, pitch deck, which is quite funny. Um, well, I just sat in the corner playing my game against Briar, uh, which ended on turn three. But um, yeah, congratulations to all, all the calling winners and and uh, yeah, shout out especially to, to the Bolton boys. Um, there's a new procedure and penalty guideline that's just been released, which now introduces a middle ground between casual and professional RER, which is competitive RER, which I think has been a long time coming, right, Brendan? I mm-hmm. think everyone can agree with this, with the Road to Nationals and, and stuff. So Road to Nationals, I believe, are actually still going to be uh, run at... Casual. I need to go and check what is competitive, what, what tiers of these... Uh, I think Road to Nationals is tier two, right? So that now, now falls under competitive RER. Um, I should have checked this. It is tier I, two. I just looked at it. It is tier two? Yeah, okay. So all tier two events and day one of the calling, which is tier three, will be run at competitive RER. So yeah, sorry, including ProQuest, Road to Nationals, Battle Harden. So I think it's a really good change um i think you know there was this kind of awkward thing where you're at road to nationals you're playing for these prizes you're playing for these gold foils you're playing for an invite to nationals for an invite to the pro tour and it's a casual rel mm. and uh it just didn't quite fit both penalty guidelines and i guess maybe um just the interaction between players and the stand you know, not the standard of play but just i guess that maybe the attitude of people if they're like, oh, it's a casual event um when in reality it's i don't think anyone's really taking that approach um so good to see competitive rel there are some changes with professional and competitive and and um I guess on gameplay infractions and tournament infractions and the penalty guidelines for this. Uh, so maybe I, I would recommend just going checking out. It's I think Josh Scott put this up and it's done in a really tight sort of like one page, maybe two page sort of article, which is really easy to digest with a table on the changes to uh, penalties as well, which is it's really clear and easy to understand. So yeah, definitely recommend going and checking out. But good to see that I think as a OP, we're starting to move towards uh, the three tier system of um, enforcement level, which I think is really good. So. Otherwise, Brendan, we've got a few videos up this week up on the YouTube mm-hmm. channel, Arsenal Pass on YouTube. Uh, we've got a, a calling recap that uh, me and the Australian team did just on kind of the decks that we played to top four. Um, and then as well, there's the Uprising set review, of course, that we did last week's pod. Uh, three hours of Uprising grading goodness. And we did a seal prep video, uh, which has been pretty well received. So thank you to everyone who's uh, sent us some nice comments on that. We hope that sort of helps you for pre-release weekend and just getting your head into limited moving forward as we head into this road to national season, uh, which starts next weekend at this point. Uh, we're in the future, Brendan. Dope. Yeah, so big shout out to the Arsenal Pass Patreon. You're all, you all support does help us do what we do, and we have seen amazing support at that. Um, so looking forward to kind of continuing in the future and crushing this road to national pro quest season, getting you all the deck techs and deck guides you need to sort of win those events. Um, we're actually going to be doing something special on the Patreon this month. So recently... Um, I posted a picture on Twitter, um, a little bit of a transformation, lost about 90 pounds in the past like two or so years, got a lot of feedback uh, from people in the community. So Hayden and I thought about doing this for Arsenal Pass, Um, we're going to do it via the Patreon Discord, but we're going to do just like in the month of July, just a little fitness month. Um, We're going to be, you know, kind of coordinating with people in the AP Patreon or in in the AP Discord and just sort of go through this and we're going to have some giveaways too. It's not going to be based off any numbers or anything like that, but it's just the five most you know, dedicated people, people that are most involved. You know, we're going to give out full art heralds, play mats, those, I don't know if you've ever seen me and Hayden playing at recent events, but we have these very, very limited edition AP life pads <laughs> we'll be giving out as well. If anybody else is like a content creator that wants to participate in this, uh, let us know. I heavily encourage you to. I think that we can have like a really awesome experience here and have a like kind of crush it this month. In terms of what Hayden and I will be doing, um, you know, in that in that Discord channel, kind of every day, I'll update literally everything I do, everything I eat, um, all the exercises I do, 
pretty much everything. So if you have, if you want to just follow along or you want to do your own thing, whatever it is, um, yeah, we'll be very active with it. Probably do like weekly calls to sort of recap, see where everybody's at, just a way to engage. Cause I think we can have some impact here. Um, yeah, it is going to be on the, like on our discord, which is technically behind our Patreon. Um, but if you have any sort of financial limitation for getting into that uh, for this month, just go ahead and DM me and I'll be happy to sort of buy you into the this month's Patreon so you can participate. I think it can be awesome. It's something that hasn't been done in Flesh and Blood before. If you're thinking about it or considering it, um, I highly recommend it because I think that if we're ever going to do it, the first time is going to be sort of the most historic and the most awesome. The idea is to sort of be healthy and for us all to go on this thir- sort of 30-day journey. Um, yeah, we just have a good time. Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, Brennan pitched this to me and I, I thought about it for a little bit and I think it's, the big takeaway for me is like, um, let's do something as a community and I think it's not about, it's not about like losing a bunch of weight or anything like that. Like for me personally, my goal for this month coming up, I thought about this is I'm going to prioritize my sleep. My sleep is going to be the most important thing to me in this month and it's going to be, it's uh, it's about healthy habits, I think. That's the one thing I'm trying to, I want to build as we do this thing as a community next month and um, for me, yeah, sleep is going to be the priority. So. It's not even about necessarily my eating or, or my exercise, although, you know, those things, of course, will be a focus for me. But my, my sleep is actually going to be the one I th- the one thing I focus on for the next month. And um, I'm going to make sure that I get s- minimum seven and a half hours sleep every night, Brendan. I'm going to move to that. That's my goal for next month. So I'm already yeah. putting it out there. I've been doing that for a while. There's a book by Matthew Walker about sleep that will pretty much change the way you, you approach that. And for it, it, like and how important it is to your every day sort of function, but also your long-term health, its contribution to Alzheimer. If you don't get enough of it, Alzheimer's. Um, so yeah, sleep is very important for me. I'm probably going to do something more weight loss based. Um, I think I'm at a good point right now, but I'll probably just get down to like a body pop percentage that is somewhat challenging, right? Like I just want to do the most challenging thing possible to sort of like set the example that if, you know, if anybody's just trying to go on this journey, hasn't done it before, like we'll be there sort of in the trenches suffering with you, like to collectively suffer. So I'm going to go really hard um, and just try to like absolutely get back down to like some ridiculous percentage or something like that. But at the same time, in a very, very healthy way. Uh, but it's something I've been wanting to do for a while because I think it's one of those things you you sort of do it and then you sort of go back up to real life after. It's like just a bit of an experience. <laughs> So well, I won't be doing another juice cleanse this month. <laughs> yeah, I've done a few of those. I did one of those with my partner and oh my God, she was uh, ferocious doing that juice cleanse. <laughs> oh, hey, I tell you what, set me up good for the calling though. Uh, cleared right out of that Starvo and chain. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Brendan, um, speaking of, I guess, healthy habits and food, let's uh, let's put some, some nice healthy things on the grill this week, I guess, and uh, head into the Guana Cookout. We have a question from um, Capolo who is... Uh, you know, a community content creator, a bit of a dash aficionado, as I understand it, comes with a Discord question. Uh, my question is about deck building. Do you have some sort of formula for the ratios of cost versus pitches, or is it gut feeling coming from the experience when determining the ratios of cost versus pitch? Thank you. Um, good question. I think, Brendan, I can, I can kind of start this way, yeah, a little yeah. bit of thought, but <laughs> ratios is one of my favorite things, as Brendan knows. Um, there's a couple of things for me. So, I don't, as much as I talk about ratios and, and pitch cost and, and cost bases and um, resource bases and think this sort of thing and resource curves, it's not actually that I have a necessarily a particular, um, a particular format or formula, I guess. The way I actually often start is I'll start with uh, what we've done previously. So if I'm looking at a, a base or something, I'll look at something I've had previously and go, okay, like, why did I have this amount of blues? Uh, why did I have this amount of, like, yellows, reds, resource? Like, is it a cost to ratio thing? Or is there something else about the deck that dictates that you want more blues? Like, um, I think a really good example of this is is when approaching, like, Fire and Limited. Like, my first thought was, okay, well, like, in Ninjas, like, you know, with Kadachis, I wanted this much. But uh, we don't have Kadachis. We, you know, we have just, like, a lot of zero cost attacks. And so my resource base comes down. I'm thinking, like, six, seven blues. Oh, but hold up. I want to, this ember, um, the weapon is really good, right? So I want to swing this every turn and now I'm starting to adjust my cost base. Uh, and then I'm thinking about feasibility and then I'm thinking about quell and then my, my resource base starts to move. So I like to use mine more of like a, a based on like my previous understanding experience and then move it based on the variables that are involved with that. But I do also start with like kind of a, a rough guideline based on my cost values. So I'll look at a, I guess, a rough draft of a deck that I've got with my, my kind of core of like the, the cards I want to do, the things I want to win the game with, and I'll start with that and go, 
Okay, like <clears throat> on an average turn, I want to play X card and X card, and that's going to cost me on average five resources. Maybe it's a weapon swing for two plus a card for three. On average, it's going to cost me five resources. Okay, well, I'm looking at three card hands, and I need like a yellow and a blue or two blues in this hand. So that's going to influence how I, I try and build decks. I'm going to start to look and go, okay, well, based on that, I need probably, you know, like a third of my deck being blues realistically to make sure. And I'll, I'll go jump on the old hypergeometric calculator. You can mm. just Google. There's a, there's one for magic that's that's pretty good. It's good for card games. It has all the input variables that you that you need. And just jump on and, and put in what's probably going to give me like a over 70% chance to draw two blues every turn. And just kind of start with that and then work backwards. And then honestly, after that, like kind of any kind of, I guess, um, formula is out the window to a degree. I'm just working on like what I think based on that the, the sort of pure numbers and the percentage chance I draw. So hypergeometric calculator I always go back to as I tweak and change blues and resource cards and reds even and and look at my cost. And then I'll reevaluate my cost base as I go. Like what's what's the constraints on every turn? What's my um, cost effects every turn? Am I at five? Oh, I've changed the deck. Now I'm at four resources average every turn and kind of just work backwards on that. Um, yeah, any, anything outside, outside there, Brendan? I know I talk to you a lot about this, Brendan, when, when we talk about decks and you tweak some stuff and I'll like take the list and go like, oh, hold up, I think you're like light on blues now because of X, Y, Z or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but it goes, the, it, it goes the other way too because so like I use the hype geom extensively as well, but like there's sometimes there'll be like, there'll be ratio heuristics that are just functionally and completely wrong. So like a particular example is like the prism deck in the last meta, like people played like heavy blues um, to sort of facilitate having enough resources to play the turn, but then you wouldn't, you would not draw yellows and then not be able to get go again um, on your heralds or on your auras, which was like super, super important. So turns out that like, although it looked pretty bad in the hype geom to cut those blues, it was just, it was probably correct. And you saw the more successful lists actually play that. Plus those lists had maybe cut a single unmovable, weren't playing these like really bad red cards, like sink blow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I definitely go more off feel, but what I'll do initially, because for me, the hardest part is always the base, like trying to figure out what are the, what is like the base amount of blues I want, et cetera, et cetera. I'll look back at like other decks that have had similar, similar curves. This is obviously harder in the, in the early days, but now, you know, if I'm looking at a chain deck i might go look at like what did my briar channel not heroic deck look like or what did my what did that chain deck look like if i'm trying to build something else that's sort of aggro right and it comes around this like 20 to 22 blue range and then i'll tweak from there um and i feel like i usually start tweaking start going by feel and then i go to the hype gm not that it comes at the end of the process but it's very much in like the sort of middle to like early middle of the process um and feel it out because you really need you really need math to sort of confirm what you're what you're experiencing yeah. because if you look at everything from like a feel perspective the amount of games and the sample size you need to actually verify if something is even remotely close to correct small. it's it's so much like it can be yeah. it can be an incredible amount um so i think that because time is not infinite that's why you have to go back to like math and stuff like that theory but yeah i do i do work a bit more um a bit more by feel than hayden it's, it's you definitely do but it's also funny because i think so one thing i, I want to point out is i think that having these kind of like you know brennan loves you heuristics but even just kind of going back to older lists and, and bases of where we've been in the past the past is not the present or the future and where we've been in the past it may not be correct to be now or in in the future um i think a good example you use is, is like the prism sort of thing right the the old prism discussion was like people are playing like 13 14 blues in their deck and then we moved to like this kind of 24, 25 blue deck. And I, I kind of still disagree with you to an extent, Brendan. I actually think like 23 to 24 blues is, is correct in those lists. But I understand that it, the, my, my next point actually is that there's no black or white on those sort of things because you can have a cost base, but then there's all these nuances that come into it, right? Like, oh, actually, I need yellows for this, but also I need to play yellows. So even though I show this many yellows in my deck, it's probably I need more than that because I'm also playing yellows out. Um, maybe I need less blues because I'm playing less blues or actually you know, nine of my blues are, are auras and I want to be playing, or 12 of my blues are auras and I want to be playing these cards out. So they're actually not really true blues. There's all these kind of like uh, variables and, and sort of nuances to even your resource base. But I think it's important to not always necessarily focus on the past. Like in the past, chain decks played like 21, 22 blues, even some, some decks playing 19. When we're working on the chain list for the Pro Tour, we're looking at actually, actually a higher cost base on some stuff, but also 
uh, an increase in like the power of the blues. You know, you had like Shriller Skull Form and some of these new blues that came in that just were better. We moved to like these lead the charge blues in the deck and things like that. And so it actually made more sense to play more blues than in the past, um, not just from like a cost base, but also because of what the blues were doing. Uh, so there's always going to be changing things as well. There's always these variables, I think. But a, a base point to start on is often just wherever I've been previously and then start to factor in all the things around that that can change. Um, you know, like use the Prism example. Maybe I actually want less blues because it impacts my deck too much. I'm playing Chain. I want more blues because of the power of the blues, whatever it is. Maybe I can play less blues because I play seven. Bel- I play seven belittles and can fetch them on demand. Exactly. Most of the time. Yep. It's like it, it, it's like yeah. A lot of things sort of they all come together, um, and you have to evaluate it in totality rather than you know kind of just sectioning off a piece and yeah. going off like oh I just need twenty five blues because I have sixty cards and my average resource my average resource cost is like two point x or whatever. Yeah. yeah yeah math is good right and it, it, like you say like, i think i maybe over a little bit too much um but it's it's a good starting point the the, the funny thing is with flesh and blood and we'll keep coming back to it when people ask questions like this great question by the way is uh it depends <laughs> and we'll try and give as much color to it as possible but honestly it's going to continue to evolve and change which is kind of the beauty of flesh and blood anyway if you do want to get your questions in for the commander cookout you can submit them to us on our, our discord if you're on discord you can email them to us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com you can tweet at us dm us drop them in the youtube comments um give brendan a little note at the realm games event this weekend if you want or just scream upset and obscenities at me from across the room and why somehow, not somehow hide your question in there all right hayden let's let's head into the main topic of the pod yeah, so as I said at the top of the show, Uprising and Class Constructed, the set is releasing over the next two weekends, depending on where you are, and we're heading into this Rhodes National season. We have a really big shakeup in the meta uh, with Living Legend, for Chain, and Bravo Star of the show, and of course, three new heroes entering plus a new card pool to contend with. So where are we going? What's happening? And I, I guess we're going to kind of break this down and start with the existing meta, right? So Brendan, I, I want to ask about the impact on the existing metagame right now what does the living legend retirement because you actually think about this what does the living legend retirement of starvo and chain mean for the existing meta heroes so if if you know i know you already asked this a little bit but if uprising wasn't around what do we think would be the best of the existing heroes like you said prism ultim briar do you think anything else plays into that for and sure. you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the reason the reason why I mentioned Prism Ultimate Briar is because like those are relatively relevant in the past meta. So a lot of people have those decks, like they have the cards for those decks, they know how to play them, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Can something like Dash come back in? Absolutely. You know, and there could be other decks in there as well. Um, like maybe Prism gets hated out enough that you can play something like a warrior. I don't know. Um, and etc. 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 I do think that uh chain and starvo rotating out is actually more much more impactful on the game than uprising. We still have yet to see sort of the um you know the heroes get built, whether you know Jermai, Icelander, or Fi are warping enough, but particularly Starvo and Chain have been extremely warping on the meta since they entered. Starvo, I think f- kind of functionally broke the game in a sense uh and prevented a lot of heroes from even functioning at a base level uh whereas chain was just like that was just the premier aggro deck to an extent um it also had game into fatigue and just like this idea of like you know being able to get get all this card advantage having go again on demand etc etc was a lot was a lot for the meta to handle so those two rotating out i think it makes things much more interesting like 10 times more interesting to be honest uh there still is old him old him is a bit of a boogeyman i think that that hero is particularly just a little bit pushed like the hero ability very strong crown of crown of seeds also very very strong but now we have a crown of providence for the aggro decks (laughs) so we'll see how that works out i think that i'm looking at old him as the boogeyman of the format uh prism obviously polices him very well i think jermai will police to a decent extent too uh and then there's going to be these uh, there's going to be aggro decks of course we're looking at briar first of all but i think that the maybe the mid-range creeps back in hayden like maybe the mid-range creeps back in because if there isn't this overly abusive linear aggressive deck that is really what keeps mid-range out of the format it's not old him and it's yeah. not it's not fatigue right because mid-range is actually pretty good against fatigue like playing something like a like a reinar or a dash that stuff is really good so i think that these decks might come back in yeah, so I think one of the things I like to do at the start of the format, uh, so w- what I'm doing in my head right now, what this is what I've done already is, okay, let's start from where we were last format and then remove any of the variables we have to remove. So two Living Legend heroes. And this way I asked this question to you, Brennan. So if I say that I'm kind of in line with you, I think Prism is going to be, would be well represented. I think Ultim would be as well. Uh, and Briar, I think this is like the, the natural place to start. That makes me think that 
if Oldham is, is good, you know, you have, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm always going to say this, right? Maybe Brutes are potential to be played, right? So is a Ryan or Olivia uh, a viable? And I, I do think in a, you know, in a, a Prism and a, a Briar format, like Olivia becomes like quite viable. And in an Oldham and Prism format, uh, Ryan R becomes quite viable. So you have two potential mid-range decks, like you say, that come back into it there. And then Dory. Dory got a lot of upgrades from this Classic Battles, actually, and, and looks kind of like, I played it in um, uh, Road to Na- uh, sorry, a Pro Quest the last weekend. So the weekend after classic battles in the last weekend of pro quest and it was friggin' scary it was my closest game i was playing chain uh that glistening steel blade is a is a card um so you know and then with the hyper sort of with chain and star of the show dropping out does that give dory an opportunity so that's kind of where my head is at of like decks those kind of like five kind of decks that maybe start the format off right and then after that you layer in these new heroes which we will get to soon but that's kind of that's probably where i'm at right now thinking okay where do we, where's my starting point of what people are going to look to potentially pick up and what could be good yeah do you also um, agree that this is more impactful do you think that the rotation of starvo and chain is likely more impactful than all three of the monarch heroes entering the format uh, i i don't know i i think I, I said at the top of the show right <clears throat> and i firmly believe this is this is by far the biggest like change we've had yes in classic constructed <clears throat> between the two things happening but it, it remains to be seen, right? Like it's easy to say it now because it's right. What's right in front of us is the Living Legend to chain and start the show. But we we haven't seen the new heroes yet in terms of what they could could look like. They're very interesting. They bring new mechanics to the game. Invocations, uh, of course, like what Fire's doing with sort of <clears throat> Phoenix Flames in the graveyard, and then Icelander, this this uh, arcanic hero that has disruption elements as well and has like a reasonable life total to start with. So I, I honestly, it's hard to say. I think if I had to decide like if you like you know now put your money on one of them i'd probably slightly agree with you and put it on the living legend but i i think it's close like the game continues to change and even if we saw in the last format like starvo didn't win the pro tour and yes it did warp the format but it wasn't necessarily even um you know it wasn't it wasn't unbeatable and people were doing things and we saw a nerf and was already changes being made so i, I don't know it's tough um want to touch on what cards are looking good in the existing heroes first so what's the impact of uprising for our already the base we're at before we even start to layer in these heroes so um i might, might go through something brendan maybe get your thoughts uh hypothermia and ultim that seems yeah. like one that um mega you know annoying. it seems like an obvious inclusion yeah mega annoying so it does not have a go again of itself that is something to consider but yeah hypothermia for those who don't know it says uh it's a ice action affliction aura um at majestic the blue zero cost two defense but it says attacks you control can't gain go again so this is going to be your opponent uh, so it's the beginning of your end phase destroy hypothermia well that's pretty good against briar <laughs> pretty good against uh pretty much yeah. well everything that wants to go wide to be fair well the fact it does destroy at their end phase but i think you're effectively making some decks take a turn off which i think this is uh i'm immediately putting this in my old deck right or at least in the sideboard yeah, and, and while we're on this kind of card, so yeah, I agree. So there's like things you can do. Maybe these builds that have Lion Strikes or Ravenous Rebels or um, Rouse the Ancients into something like this seems pretty good, right? Mm. Um, but then you also have, uh, and I'm uh, Fog Down, which is, uh, again, doesn't have Go Again, but is a three cost, non attack actions, lose and can't gain, Go Again. This to me, at yellow, um, and then you destroy at the beginning of your action phases an aura that costs three. I'm more interested in this in like prism decks, I think, but in this kind of like mid rangey control sort of illusionist decks. But it could could see play in ultimate as well. That's another card that's interesting to me. But yeah, a hypothermia, zero cost, ice. You can just obviously use it as an ice react. You can um, wait for it. You can crown it. You can wait until you have some go again. You play it, or you can just like trade. You know, you can trade your hand. Okay, I trade three cards into you. I arsenal this like ridiculous. You know, I would arsenal my pulverize or whatever. And then I play my hypothermia, and then you know you can't really do anything on your turn. And then on my turn, I just I just come in with you know my pulverize or whatever it is. I kind of swing tempo. So hypothermia is really interesting to me. Um, maybe Arctic incarceration as well, Brendan. So the new ice card that creates frostbites is that mm. better than Winter's Bite? Probably not, but it, it could be used in addition as well, right? That's another card that I'm looking at. It depends, all right? Winter's Bite making them discard a card. Um... It's very good. Yeah. taxes resources differently yes it does tax resources differently and also gives them you know some of these cards are actually able to interact with frostbites now so you have like particularly the new mm-hmm. what is it the new ice affliction the one that deals damage but mm-hmm. yeah i'm not sure if this is specifically better or or not but i think that it is a tool that that deck will use particularly like the blue one right the blue one seems pretty nice you're just yes, putting yeah. a frostbite yeah. and a target hero's control the red we'll see you know three three i mean three frostbites can pretty much 
turn off uh turn off the turn for a lot of these aggro decks of old something like you think like uh cheerio briar like yeah, what would it do yeah with i mean frostbites? <laughs> it's done chill to the bone you had to hit this one you just play it and they just get through frostbites like against something maybe like a, a, a five for instance that might be heavily red line could be a very good card could just blank their their whole turn effectively maybe even um katsu or yeah i think that card is interesting to look at anyway and then the next one i want to talk about is ghostly touch and prison builds um this kind of legendary that's I, I think looks really powerful and could be this kind of end game in these more sort of hero based prism decks um although maybe that's a dramatic thing but yeah that's definitely something that that I'm looking at, or when I say Herald and Dramai, I mean like a uh, uh, Phantasm and Dramai. But this is definitely something that I'm interested in. There is a Dramai deck that has been sort of swirling around in my brain. Something that sort of uses cards like Uvia and something like Ghostly Visit. All right, hold see. it, hold it, hold it for the uh, for the Dramai section then. Dramai section. Okay, we'll get there. We'll get yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, hold it. here's my opinion: is uh, yeah, maybe it could be good in Dramai. <laughs> what about Prism? Prism, um. Yeah, I think that, so what is it competing with? That's really the question. I don't think... Well, nothing, that's not kind of the thing. It's like exactly. Dreamweavers and yeah. Ironhide, like kind of nothing. Yeah, so it's, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to slot in, right? You might, you might play the Goliath Gauntlet still, occasionally, and you also might still Maybe. play the Ironhide, stuff like that, if you need the defensive value, which is... But, yeah, this is, I think it's, strict, it's probably going into most of your prison builds. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have this idea, this, the, my first thought was like, okay, you have this kind of more mid-rangey hero build you you come in with some early game you know you you bust into their their poppers their six attacks uh you stack up like even like as minimum as like three or four counters and then at some point you just you know you've like maybe you've got another aura and then you drop the uh the, the aura that stops phantasm pops in your first attack and then you're now just coming in with this into some auras game plan like in kind of middle to end game um it's just kind of this like sticky threat right that they literally can't deal with if you have that aura in play um, it kind of reminds me of like Manlands and and um, and Magic. It's uh, it seems yeah. quite powerful to me, but how it actually plays out will be interesting. In terms of Ninja, I mean Double Strike, and of course the new legendary equipment, the Tiger Stripe Shuko uh, for for Katsu. If we're talking about existing heroes, you know maybe this like Pouncing Links Hundred Wins deck that we saw a little bit in the last format that people were kind of playing. I know someone played Pro Tour. You know, with with Double Strike and and the new legendary, does this become a viable archetype potentially? It's going to be a good question. Um, we've talked about it a few times on the pod that we we I don't know if you completely agree with me, but I sort of feel like Katsu's gotten a lot of side grades rather than upgrades. Other heroes maybe not gotten the same treatment. He's gotten different ways to play, but none have have quite risen to the top. Um, obviously, we do have Mask of the Pouncing Links, and now we have more cards that are caring about that low base attack. Um, mm -hmm. So potentially, potentially, I, I, it's too early for me to say like, yes, this is going to be a dominant ninja archetype that's going to supersede sort of the default, um, you know, surging line that you will usually play. But it's interesting, yeah. right? We this this feels like more tools to add on to a package that felt underwhelming, but now this might bring it over the line. I mean, it, it's really powerful. Like, even if you trigger this four or five times over the the, the course of a game, which seems pretty easy in these maybe like hundred wins decks and. Um, you know, get yellow belittled and probably red belittled in there as well, maybe. Um, it seems a lot easier to do uh, and quite an aggressive sort of, you know, the problem is like you trade off mask momentum, right? That's always the tough thing. But pouncing links can be pretty powerful. You can set up some pretty disgusting combos um, with 100 wins turns. Uh, and the, the what's the new one? The yellow one from Everfest, the, the five dominate player card. I can't remember what it's called. People know what I mean if they've played some Katsu. Um, Crown of guy. Providence. I think... What's that? I said, not this guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I know you don't. Uh, people know. Uh, Crown of Providence. I mean, th this card just seems but, good, right? Yeah, basically Iron Rod, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> no, this card is pretty much... Double th arms. This, this, yeah, this card is going to be better than, than, um, than Skullcap in most decks. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know about most decks, in but, but most in decks. proactive aggro decks. In most decks, it'll be better than, than, <laughs> than Skullcap. <laughs> It's fine. You're you wrong. You're wrong, and so is everybody else if they think so. Like Crown of Providence is basically tunic, tunic crown seeds, but you get to use it once per game, and it has defensive value. And of course, the the low to the ground, <laughs> like the the easy picking is with yeah. This is gonna be great in aggro decks. It's gonna be a staple, right? It's honestly like it's potentially even too powerful in aggro decks because it's gonna make them just even more consistent. That being said, I think if there's any card that I wanted to get my hands on in this set. To add to my current, my current, uh, my current decks, or you know, my current collection of cards, it'd be Crown of Providence. Like I think this is a staple 
now and it will be stable to come. This card is very, very powerful. Luckily, you have a call for. No, I, I agree it is very powerful. I, my point is that I think it depends on what the meta looks like. Because you said it's going to be played in most decks. Well, it depends on the meta. Like, so a, a lot of decks are going to play Crown of Seeds and Mask of Momentum. You know what I mean? So, like, it, it depends on what the meta actually looks like. But I, I agree that this is very, very powerful and is going to be played in a lot of decks. And I think any proactive aggro deck should play this over basically any other head unless it's a Mask of Momentum or Pouncing Links. Yes, especially if you if you are in any way the aggressor and you're not playing a class like that can utilize Crown of Seeds or uh, um, or Mask of Momentum or any sort of other busted hood that might be available that is class specific. This is probably what you're New using. Horizon. New Horizon. Yeah, New Horizon. That's that's kind of what I mean. Like actually, when I broke it down the other day. I was like, oh, what what like what heroes play this immediately? I think like right now it's only like three. It's like Briar, the Brutes and dash i think like the ones that are like immediately picking this up right now just because there's like a lot of guardians there's lexi there's ninjas in the format like <laughs> the warriors play this too yeah sure yeah, yeah sorry the warriors yeah yeah yeah. which you know uh, dorinthia because bolton doesn't really exist unfortunately the kano's no i'm kidding <laughs> you actually might play this card in kano against against the uh, prism maybe right because i know some people were stretching it a bit and they play skull cap against prism because they didn't want to die to the first air edition unfortunately that's just how it is. You get hit by your edition, you get hit. But this one, because you might get that five card blue hand, okay, that's fine. But uh, I still that's don't know. Let's talk about the sleeper card of the set, Hayden. The sleeper card of the set, in my opinion, is Oasis Respite. A common. Yeah, I mean, the, the, is it a sleeper? The card's ridiculous. It's a sleeper because it's a, it's a common. It's going to be, I think sure, this is okay. a classic constructed, it's going to be a classic constructed staple, especially in the sideboard. Like, this is effectively, if you play something like Tunic, this could, this is one for five off your Tunic resource, not even using a card on hand. Obviously, that's like if pigs could fly, but. Not that hard to do, and this is really good against. It just blo it just blank blocks damage, right? Like that. That's really good. If you're below life, it gains it gains a life on top of that, so you can be getting five out of the red one here. I think this is really powerful. It's also probably it's very bad for Kano. <laughs> it's very bad for Kano. Um, yeah, I think this is the, it's kind of an it's kind of a smaller note and an anecdote here, but I think this might be the death of Wildfire combo. <laughs> but people could always not back it. People could have played Aaron as prayer, but yeah. I, I think this card is infinitely better than prayer, right? In terms yes, of like its, its versatility. I think the one thing, like if you are looking for a comparison point, because I was thinking about this card, I was like, oh, this card seems like crazy good. You know, even in like ultimate stuff, you go pitch for shield, crown, play this, right? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a lot of damage to prevent. You know, it's a defense reaction that costs one that effectively could gain you five life. But then I thought about it some more, and I was like, okay, sink below zero cost, right? Yep. As like a comparison point, and then I was thinking about steel blade shunt. It's like one for six at red. Um, so there is like these comparison points to where I think Oasis Respite is is very good and is going to be like you say a, a staple in certain archetypes uh, to come, especially you know it, it has this double duty as like a defensive card against physical and arcane damage. Um, but I have attempted my sort of thought of where this card might land a little bit, although I do still think we're going to see this in the next constructive format and constructive formats to come. Yeah, for sure. But Blitz especially, I think, actually, because of the, the durability of it. Like, you know, you, you don't have no sideboards, so here's something that deals with Arcane and with Physical, depending on the format, which is quite Yeah, cool. it could slow down the format a lot, too. <clears throat> yep. Right, let's, uh, we've talked about the existing format. Let's go and talk about the new heroes, uh, and let's start with Dromai. So we're going to talk through sort of, like, strength, weaknesses, where we think it fits in, sort of early week one builds that we would, we, you know, we are kind of looking at and, and what we think where to start, um, and just talk through some of, like, the key cards as well. So Dromai, Brennan, Strengths. Um, I had a couple written down here. I think, like, board presence is, of course, going to be, like, Dramai's prime strength, right? You have the new f invocations. You have these cards that, that effectively put board presence on. They uh, they can be attacked, of course, but they it's different to how auras were in the past. You can, a lot, I think, a lot more efficiently play two of these in a turn, even maybe even three. Um, and I guess that's quite a big thing. It does definitely feel like it can take over games pretty quickly, especially combining with Ash Rings as well. You now have all these threats you have to deal with and you have to find ways to deal with them efficiently. They'll continue to just chip in like Spectral Shields, uh, but now you have to attack them individually. It's, it's quite tough, although harder to get. Um, feels like it's going to bully Wizards, right? Like that feels like a, a strength of, of what you can do with Dromine Constructed. It's an illusion. Uh, that's it, an illusion thing, brother. <laughs> they just wreck wizards, wizards, man. Uh... Might be better than Prism versus Aggro, I think is kind of my early thoughts on this, just in terms of the ability for you to, uh, you know, the dragons. So when you play like, <clears throat> when you play the auras, right, it's a threat and it 
it obviously puts something on the board but also those cards don't defend naturally with the invocations you have these cards that all defend for three and then you have a much i think you have a much nicer decision to make you have the ability to defend a lot more than you would if you didn't have them uh, and you can decide which ones you play and when whereas with auras it's like well okay i have the pitches or i have to play this now and it's actually not really the one i want to play now but you know what other choice do i have other than just pitching it for maybe a footsteps plus a special shield or maybe i pitch it to play a shield or you know um I always forget the card. What's the yellow defense reaction? Soul Shield. Um, you know, you, I think you have a lot more dis- decision points, which is good, and you have these cards that defend. And then also they're just they're cheaper, right? You know, you, you play a zero cost one off a, off a one card hand, and now all of a sudden you have like this threat off a one card hand, and it immediately attacks, and it can gain you some, uh, potentially something. So like Chromai, for instance, gives you some insurance against poppers, and then there's this like three attack threat that they potentially have to deal with or you know then you play a second threat and now all of a sudden you have multiple threats it's um or you play two threats the next turn tank some damage to do it so yeah i think it could potentially be better against aggro than something like prism potentially um i think that this deck is also just very good against old him still so yes prism has spectra but if you're dropping two two dragons a turn i don't think that guardians can keep parity with you I think that the deterrents where they clear two dragons are very good turns for them. Um, and on average, they might clear one. So I think that if you're dropping anywhere, you know, if you're dropping even close to two dragons a turn, I think you're going to have a similar effect that Prism does onto Guardian decks. And I think this this deck will also be very good against Guardian. Um, against aggro and stuff like that. So the, what's interesting about Jeremiah is that, like, this, she has some toolbox dragons, right? Like Invoke Domina, the one that can banish, I think it banishes a card from the opponent's hand, right? Um, be my. Yeah. And then this, like, the Snatch one, all that stuff that if decks aren't able to block efficiently, it it can be pretty devastating. So I'm floating between two Jermai decks, right? One that's more of an aggro deck, and then another that is a pretty hard control deck, obviously utilizing a new Legendary out of of, uh, Illusionist, but using things like Uvia to develop a sort of overwhelmingly, (laughs) overwhelming board advantage to sort of maybe not OTK, but effectively get somewhere close to that, where it's just like... You have so many, so many things on board that you can just overwhelm your opponent. When you talk about old, being good against Ultim and clearing two threats, you think they won't have? Because obviously they have Phantasm, right? These dragons all have Phantasm. Mm-hmm. So you're not swinging, right? You're just right. So you're trying to use the the static abilities of these these heroes, yeah. right? Or yeah. trying to get to a point where eventually you are attacking with a bunch of Ash Wings and you can. You know, you can afford to... Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely get it, right? Like, in terms of... I, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be better than what you can do with auras, right? Because you just kind of not, ultimately no, not interact better. with multiple yeah, touch points. Not right, necessarily right, better, good. but close to, like, maybe close to on par to where, like, you can play a deck that's better into aggressive decks, because I agree with you there, because they, 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 these things inherently block, um, but also still dunks on Guardians. <laughs> like, and I think that that's potentially what, what Jeremiah offers, right? Because like, if you are able to develop a disgusting amount of dragons throughout the game, you have ways to sort of make your attacks potentially lose Phantasm or gain action points, whether it's through Time Snap or your boots. You and could potentially Jermai. have that happen. Yeah, you could have that happen more than four times in a turn after you develop this large board and you effectively just kill your opponent on a single turn because nothing can do about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think it makes sense. Um... Other strength, I think, kind of, like you say, you kind of talked about it already, but this ability to establish multiple threats and angles of attack, which we're going to talk about through some builds, is definitely a strength. And then weaknesses. I mean, the dragons, like you say, although they're static abilities, not all of them have these. And, of course, you know, they just die to phantasm poppers, right? Like, that is still a thing. And I think into mid-range decks in particular, that potentially could be could be an issue. I, I'm, you know, a deck that's able to put on a lot of pressure from a, an attacking standpoint and also just have one or two of these like you experienced with heralds in the past but now all of a sudden you know um of course you you know how, how do you because the, the the phantasm boots right they're on uh, attack action cards only right so they don't actually work on on these dragons yeah yeah so i'm just so lock- how does go ahead oh no <laughs> i was just gonna say so like what's the plan into something like that i'm not sure to be honest i'm lost in the world of mask momentum triggering off of you hitting these things right when i attack action yep. card you control is third or higher on the chain link in a row to hit draw card. so it's not player so these things can't fun- uh, these dragons can effectively function as ways to guarantee like these very powerful hit triggers i have to go look at like all the ninja ones like surging strike stuff like that like cost ability which i don't have in my mind if they have that hits a player kind of text but mask momentum being sort of the most prevalent probably the one we should think about first well, you can trigger mass just off aether ash ranks. that's ridiculous 
It's very yep. powerful. Yeah, um, that's definitely one of the biggest things about what Katsu can do. Um, and uh, no, it's just whenever an attack action you control hits on Katsu. So um, yeah, all of the abilities you can do uh, without the the need for... It's also the same for Mask of Pouncing Links and stuff as well. So definitely into ninjas, that kind of feels like the natural kind of... Um, feels like a counter. <laughs> yeah, hard, hard kind of counter. And then just kind of on that um, the footsteps piece, like the footsteps, yeah, they don't work on on the dragons only attack actions so uh this kind of idea of like have, you don't have a natural way to sort of push through if your first attack gets popped each turn without the aura uh or without chrome eye so just something to bear in mind is that these definitely are weaknesses um and yeah. how they might be able to stop those aggressive strategies yeah like chrome it's, eye what's the other one miraga the one who makes the first one lose phantasm like it's miraga yeah. i could just be saying the name wrong yeah. That's why when like when I was talking about this sort of like larger control deck that would sort of overwhelm the board, it'd probably play things like time step ways to like recoup its action point, um, and it would, yeah, just basically overwhelm the board in case the opponent did have a few poppers. Yeah, I think you've got to work out what what that kind of looks like and balance off the ability of maybe defending out a few attacks from your opponent or trying to build your board but not attacking because you can't afford to lose your mm -hmm. stuff to their defense plus their offense and just what that kind of looks like it's going to be a, a real puzzle i think and that's that's the the hardest thing about building Dromai, i think but um i mean it could just be that dromai has got enough power that it kind of doesn't matter we'll, we'll we'll have to wait and see these dragons are pretty cost efficient so we'll see but it feels really well balanced which i like mm -hmm. um i guess where do we see it fit in i mean like you say right could benefit from a lot of guardians still being around highly played so your ultims um maybe it plays well into mid-range decks just naturally we'll, we'll have to wait and see and then how to build it uh you kind of already alluded to this right but control style deck something to similar last prison builds that utilize the onboard effects like you talked about over i think um over is like a really powerful dragon that can be used for onboard effect and for this kind of control style pattern just continually stacking up at the ash wings each and every turn um and then maybe there's more of a phantasm based deck that uses the arms so something like i talked about before with prism is there a deck that uses that uh, with like Chimera Enigmas and these Cinepies and things like that? Yeah. Uh, more power up front than transitions to maybe something a little bit slower in the mid games once you get down sort of that aura plus the the arms plus the ghostly touch. And then, yeah, what else What else could you have? Well, I think the deck that we're going to see first is going to be an aggro deck. Things that use like Calora. Mm. I think it's Calora. I, gosh, I can't even say. But like, um, you know, using a lot break of these the red line. Yeah, and... rake the embers, like burn them all, like stuff like that, where you just have this red line aggressive deck, like invoke domina. Um, and you do have the set of pies, but you have the boots as well with that. So you're able to throw that away, still develop the rest of your board, still come in with things that are relevant threats and develop dragons on the back of it. Is that going to be good in a ninja? Maybe not. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Probably won't be as good in a ninja, but it could still be a premier aggro deck. Um, and maybe you can sort of have that hybrid prism effect where you are a premier aggro deck, right? You are a premier aggro deck, but at the same time, you can have this sort of like sideboard where you sideboard into a plan that just dunks on guardians, kind of like prism does, yeah. right? Yeah. And what's the cut? You were talking about like Kyloria, just as like a really powerful, it's like Snatch on a Stick. Is that the one? Yeah, like about? Snatch on a Stick. Like that, that fits well into an aggressive deck, right? It's like, okay, you have to either throw a card into this or you need to block, right? Like this, it's very powerful. Yep, completely agree. Okay, uh, I want to talk about some key cards before we kind of finish off. And, uh, you know, actually, the, the one I want to start with first is Burn Them All, because that's an interesting card that I haven't heard talked about as much. Maybe I'm just not running in the right circles, but um, that card to me, like you say, with this kind of like. A, a proactive deck maybe an aggressive deck the other one for me actually is just like is there kind of like a combo finisher with burn them all i mean you can have it stick around for um for multiple turns and then kind of finish them out so burn them all brennan uh combo finisher or aggro card or not very good what is it mm, i had it played it on me unlimited and it felt like a uh, like a combo card i'm not gonna lie um yeah so i'm not sure if i would have it i could be so wrong about this but i don't really see a deck that is centered around this as a combo card, but I see it fitting in very, very nicely to an already aggressive deck. Mm -hmm. That it card feels... does seem really powerful to me. Um, interested to see how, how it kind of plays out. Um, unsure. <laughs> it seems good, though. does seem powerful. <laughs> does seem powerful. Uh, other than, like, some of the cards we've already talked about, Rake the Embers, it seems like it's going to be important. Ovia, like we talked about, Chromai, just what that does. The other kind of, the last one I want to talk about was, like, just Tomaltai. I think that... That dragon is, is very powerful, and we're seeing these more more of these effects in the set that can target equipment, that can deal with equipment. We've got Liquify uh, as the Draconic attack reaction as well. And of course, Tomaltai that can uh, can potentially put a minus one counter on and uh, and destroy an equipment for zero defense. And you don't even have to hit with it, you just have to attack with it. <laughs> and if you reveal a red card. Yeah. This and, very good. Yeah, this and Liquify is adding a lot more. I think this makes the game actually more interesting and more dynamic. We saw it with Expose the yeah. Elements. Um, 
but just more ways to make your equipment not safe, right? They've been these permanents on the battlefield, but now they're finally at risk, you know? So I think this is adding to like, I think it's overall just net beneficial for the game. It, yeah, like you say, good to see some interaction with equipment and equipment's so powerful. And then also uh, you can now got to think about how you use your equipment as well, especially your battle worn and temper. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's go into Fi. Let's talk a bit about Fi. Um, I mean, strength-wise, I think they're pretty up front here, right? Rupture, uh, you've got the go-wide ability with Phoenix Flames for things like Mask Momentum, and just the fact that your hero ability is very, very abusable. You know, if the game goes even sort of mid, you know, you go sort of 7 to 10 turns, it's a lot of value you're getting out of your hero ability, right? Like, that, that to me, when I look at Fi, I just go, the hero ability is inherently very, very powerful. Is it better than Kadachi against, Kadachi against Aggro decks? Or, sorry, Control decks, sorry um maybe yeah. I, like it is it's it's in a similar sort of vein right except that you know you you get the ability to use your resources in other ways like anything that's that can be free is always so good like it's always so abusable in this game i think so that's something that i just immediately look at like kadachi's cost you two resources yes There's, so the inverse of that is that um like with kadachi kadachi all you need to do is pitch it blue and as you get into the later part of the game with Fi, you might uh, run out of threats to be able to sort of recur those yep. at an efficient rate so they could be worse than Kadashi Kadashi, but like throughout the early to mid game, probably more powerful, right? Because it is free. <laughs> well, when have you when has Kadachi Kadachi been a good control threat? When was the last time it was actually a good control threat? Like Dash does it better, Alton oh. does it better. Oh, with, well, you yeah. know what I mean? Welcome to Wraith. <laughs> yeah, <definitely>. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome Crucible, to I would say. Crucible. <laughs> well, it's, the... it's like kind of giving Ninja this game against like, you know, the Guardians and stuff like that. I guess nowadays it's a bit of a boomer mentality because Guardian has freaking Ice React. Earth React, Crown of Seeds, you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Crown of Seeds Shield takes care of both your Kadachis. Gosh. So, yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, the immediately thing is I look at that fire ability and go, okay, like, what can we do with this? And even if it's an aggro deck, that's just super explosive, and that's definitely one of the most important things about fire. I guess weaknesses, uh, you're definitely more restrained for combo in terms of you don't have Kaltz's ability, uh, you have less of the, the combo finishes, of course, you, you know, don't have access to the Lord of Wind line, things like this. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and then you, you, you know, resource tax is going to be a real thing in this format between ultim and icelander um and you're pretty susceptible to that uh, especially if it's you know channel like frigid is potentially one of the best cards against you if not the best card against you in the game yep um i'm really interested to see if the tax does stop the- it's funny because i feel i feel a little rock paper scissory coming out here in terms of theory right like this deck Maybe. feels disgustingly good against uh against Dramai. But also mm-hmm. very susceptible to tax. We've seen this before in Flesh and Blood. We have seen this <laughs> where they've come out with a deck that looks like, you know, oh, it's going to tax. It's going, it's really going to make things suck. That was old him into the old chain. Didn't really mm-hmm. pan out. Um, so while the theory is there, I'm interested to see if the execution will happen. But yes, looking at the addition of ice cards on top of that, ice afflictions and stuff, does look rough. Does look like you're going to have a really hard time playing five of those decks. My question is like, is there multiple ways to build Phi? Like, can you build a Phi deck that is less susceptible to that kind of, uh, that yeah. kind of hate? A mid-range deck that maybe takes care, that utilizes the Phi ability for just pure, pure advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. I guess talking about how to build it. I mean, so one interesting thing for me is the Searing Ember Blade versus Kadachis, or even Needle. Like, what does that look like? And I think that's going to depend on what the deck is. So I think there's a build that's just really focused around Rupture. Lava Burst is a very powerful card, right? um so uh, you know so is the the red hot and and even the the one cost sort of like the mini command and conquer against some decks is really good so i think there's this rupture deck which really utilizes kadachis uh is definitely a thing but then there's maybe there's more of a, a just a draconic deck a draconic based deck that uses uh, searing ember blade and a bunch of zero costs uh could also be a thing and then do we just have like a traditional mask aggro ninja deck mask went to aggro deck like take your katsu deck that was an aggro deck your 100 wins deck and just put it into fly and you just replace some of the more efficient draconic cards and obviously the cards you can't play in fly and then you just have this ninja aggro deck that also now has more ways to trigger mask momentum with um potential you know getting back <clears throat> your phoenix flames although yes you have less draconic chain links even if you still have two draconic chain links you pay one you get back a phoenix flame that's another chain link as well so uh for your mask momentum so more more threats there and then i think um you know is there like i talked about the cards is there actually this hundred wins tiger stripe shuko dot deck with maybe even like pouncing links and um things like that we'll see um to be honest when it comes to that i I just don't know the i just don't know the answer quite yet i think that the theory is there for it to exist but how it plays into the meta is particularly interesting if we see my dominated meta this is the first deck i'm looking at this and katsu to be fair 
I, I think this is, so if we talk about like kind of impact on road to national season, because that's something I'm interested in, I think this is a place people will start because I think it's a place I'm going to start. It makes a lot of sense. Like what is, we've just come out of a format, well, two, you know, two, three formats in a row. We've always had this kind of like strong aggro deck, right? Mm-hmm. What's our strong ag- aggro deck now? Is it Briar? Briar. Maybe, but more so, is it Katsu or Fire? And what do those decks look like? Especially Fire. And I think that's where people are going to start. It's always week one of a, of a season, a new season, starting with the, the most linear, consistent aggro deck is not a bad place to be it's often a very good place to be we saw it with road to nationals last year um with like what is the most like linear kind of deck to play week one was katsu in that instance but it was actually a defensive deck but you know like that's that's the the mentality and if we're coming into a format where we've got this potential very strong aggro deck you know what does that look like um brennan did just want to talk about a few key cards we hadn't already touched on because there's some powerful cards that fire has access to so of course you know you've got your phoenix flames you've got um uprising you know i've yep. had this played against me a couple of times in the limited now yeah, that yeah, card yeah. is uh very very good <laughs> zero for four uh you do also have a card like blaze uh blaze headlong you know zero for four in this deck basically is unconditional go again because you're always going to be playing red cards um and phoenix form that card seems like a, a pretty powerful card you know one for five go again draw three cards if you can turn on all the effects on hit draw three cards that's um that's pretty powerful <laughs> Yep, see, like it, it looks like one of those cards in theory is something that you sort of play around, right? Uh, like you try to get all of its effects. Maybe you play it towards the end game. Maybe you pitch it. Usually, the way these things end up playing out is that it's sort of one of those things that you just get value off of it when you have it, mm-hmm. um, and that tends to be sort of the path that they take. That being said, Blazing Hedgehog, that's a great card. Um, like zero for four, go again consistently in the stack. Uh, I think that's exactly where you want to be. Another card we talked about, Liquify. <laughs> like, I think, a, yeah, like, mm. this just impact on on armor, even if it is limited, is really important, right? If there is a, if there are, there could be specific decks do crop up where this is just very, very good against them. Um, week one of Road to Nationals. My five, if I was going to play five, my five deck would have to be Old Him. Um, I don't want to be on an aggro deck that yeah. loses to Old Him. That's it. But if you're, if my, if that, if you find an aggro deck that beats Old Him, give it to me. I'm playing it, right? It's probably the best deck in the format. It's the know? best deck. Yeah. It's probably the best deck in the format, at least in the <laughs> early format. Definitely. Like if you find an aggro deck that beats Old Him, go for it. That's it. That's the deck. Dash, baby. What are you talking about? Dash. Dash is very reasonable. Dash is a very reasonable pick. I think that we are going to see a resurrection of Dash. Yeah, am I playing Dash Week 1 of Road to Nationals? Maybe, maybe. We'll have to wait and see. I need to do a little bit of testing and play some games. Maybe. Um, the the last... So, the, I actually, I just want to touch on, because I think you brought up a great point. I want to reiterate it, is what you talked about with Phoenix Form. That card has a really low um, ceiling. Uh, sorry, a really high ceiling and a really... Oh, my goodness, I'm struggling. A really high ceiling and a really high floor as well, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. And I think that's... You've made a perfect point. These kind of cards look like, oh, maybe, you know, you do want to set it up, but actually... Often just playing them, like you say, you're you're always going to have a Phoenix Flame. You're always going to get some sort of value out of it. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, okay, I draw it in the right turn. I have the three Phoenix Flames. Or I sit in Arsenal for maybe two turns. Um, it's it's really powerful. Yes. <laughs> Icelander. Let's uh, go into our, our last hero as we talk through Classic Constructor with Uprising. What are some of the strengths of Icelander? Well, you know, Disruption, right? That's kind of the obvious one that comes to, to mind first. Of course, you have access to all the ice cards that disrupt, Channel Lake Frigid, Hypothermia, Channel the Bleak Expanse. Uh, but damage. then, of course, you also just have these things like Ice Vein. Like Aether Ice Vein is a very powerful card, right? What does Icelander do to the format? Does everybody play Arcane Barrier now? Do people stop not putting it in their deck? Because I now there's two wizards, right? Like Kano, I don't have a lot of faith for him. We're going to talk about that. But like now that Icelander's in the format, like is this going to change up like just the way people approach sideboarding, right? Because we would off the cut Arcane Barrier a lot. Now, if like Icelander is even a reasonable deck, it just seems like it probably was statistically correct before, but now it seems very statistically correct. But uh, a benefit of Icelander, getting back to what you were talking about, is Arcane Damage, right? Is attacking on this other vector that is not physical damage. Here's a question for you. Is it correct to play Arcane Barrier against Icelander? That's a good question. I don't know, because sometimes it's not, right? It could not be. Is, is it, yeah. Is it like, is it, if you're playing an aggro deck, maybe you're playing fire, are you actually better off playing three red Erinus prayers and the card that you really care about is things like I ate the ice vein, you know, right? These ones that like deal yeah. damage and, but like, but what you actually really care about in those kind of aggro decks is the tax that's coming out of Iceland. I don't even know if it's that, if it's the arcane damage, like that is what will of course eventually kill you. But if you can't even play your game, I mean, they're just going to kill you anyway, right? Like you have to still be able to play your game. And is that more important than dealing with, your opponent's kind of damage it might well be right like 
the Icelander, we'll talk about weaknesses in a second, but one of the weaknesses Icelander has is it doesn't have this ability like Kano to just kind of just kill you out of nowhere. Like it has to set it up more. It has to deal more incremental damage. It can't just be like, oh, I've got, you know, thing into blazing into, you know, wildfire. You know, it doesn't have this wildfire combo. I mean, it can set it up. It's, it's a lot more convoluted, but it's very different to what Kano can do when all of a sudden it's just like you're on your own turn, you have no resources up and they flip multiple cards off the top and just 25, 30 damage you. Um, it's a lot harder to pull off with with Icelander. So is your first concern, actually, just making sure you can play your game? Yeah, I think that, and this could be wrong, but I feel like Icelander is going to be a polarized deck in the sense that it's going to have good matchups and then terrible matchups. I also feel like it'll either be a good deck or a bad good deck. <laughs> I really good do. Claim. Good claim. Yeah, it, that's the claim. <laughs> What's funny is I was really I was really impressed with what people did with Icelander back in the Blitz format. Where they kind of flipped on its head, played this like fire breathing combo, and played this you know this mix of attack actions and not and uh, and arcane damage, is that the way to go potentially? Right, like I think that that's something that maybe this class actually wasn't designed with the intent of, but by building a deck around that, you can potentially make it more powerful than it was supposed to be uh, by design. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited for that. I'm excited for. I think Icelander has. We talked about Jeremiah being a puzzle, but I think Icelander actually is the hardest puzzle. Um, because oh, there's so uh, much going on. Yeah. Yeah, what are you actually trying to do? I agree. I've got a few few ideas in my mind. I actually built up a, a sort of a base of an Iceland the other day, which I'll talk about. But the last kind of weakness I want to talk about, just going off this idea of like you can't just Kano people, is, um, you know, you've got these kind of setups, but it's things like, oh, I need to get three Frost Hex into play first, and then I Ice Eternal them. You know, yeah. There's like, it's, it's such a, you know, it's a really big sort of set up to be done it's not like oh i just asked my wildfire and at some point i just have three blues and a blazing and they're dead <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's very different so how to build it brennan uh, my kind of first thought was like actually this more kind of control based deck which wants to utilize taxes really preys on aggro decks uses cards like absorbent ether to combo damage out on your opponent's turn i think that absorbent ether is like a, quite a powerful card potentially in icelander it works well with your cost structure so Okay, I pitch a blue, I absorb an ether, and then I play my blue my blue card out from, from Arsenal, whether it's just like a tax effect, whether it's a bit of arcane damage, and then either I pitch another card and play um, my, you know, sorry, to, to, to push the arcane damage rather, because um, you need to to get the plus two on absorb an ether, don't know what I'm talking about, but then also I get to use my wand afterwards, right? Like, is that how I'm going to push my damage? Uh, and I think what weapon you play is really interesting. Do you play... Um, the new weapon, the staff that actually comes with it, or are you looking to play like the um Kraken's Aether Vein? I, I'm so bad. I think Kraken's you yeah, I think you play the I think you play the new the new weapon. The Aether Vein, it's it's pretty good against aggro decks, I guess, but like I don't know. The new weapon is so powerful. Um, especially with the new equipment as well. I I think I think my first where I'm gonna go first with when Icelander mean? is very unimaginative. So I'm gonna play Icelander good stuff. I'm gonna play good attacks. Good zero cost attacks off Gogan, things like E Strike, maybe something like Scar for Scar, etc. Yeah. And I'm gonna do Gogan attack into you know like powerful one cost red or maybe two cost something like whatever, um, and then hit with my hit with, hit with my yeah. hit with my hit with my word because like if you, the Hanel, waning moon yes. Scar for Scar well, come in for you know twelve damage on the yes. turn or whatever three and then ta- and then have some aspect of tax in that game plan as well. Mm-hmm. It's like is that just is that enough, right? Because that sort of game plan in the past metas like it's just too adorable. Like I just don't think it would work. But now Starvo and Chain are gone, and like that's a that's a decent amount of damage, especially like an E Strike into the into these two things. Like you're looking at something like eleven to twelve damage, right? Um, so. I think it could be good, especially if you sprinkle in a little bit. Very efficient tax it has to be the efficient, <laughs> the efficient cards that will tax the opponent. Yeah, I, my my issue with all these kind of plans always, and I always come back to this, is like it's middling, and where it's is middling. my power actually coming from? And like, am, am I actually doing something powerful at that point, or am I just kind of playing in them? And this is why I think mid range really struggles on flesh and blood, and it's a it's a bigger issue we can talk about at some point. But um, I always come back to: is this really what I want to be doing in this game when I could be doing something? on either sides of the spectrum that are a lot more polarizing and powerful. But ma- maybe, could... maybe Icelander is the, the one that breaks the mold. Um, what if I could just draw yeah. seven more cards in my opponent via like a, <laughs> via a soul shackle that I've built up over the game? Can't do it anymore. But I like, can't do it anymore. Yeah, that's what happens is like, you just get a little too adorable yeah. with some of these, these, uh, these mid-range game plans. They just don't, they don't exist in real life. It's just kind of boomer flesh and blood. Um, yeah. Can it work though? For sure. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, mean, I think it can. It's just like, yeah, it's um, it's trying to play a fair game, and and I think maybe maybe the game's just getting fairer. Maybe that's what we're about to see. We'll we'll, we'll find out. 
Uh, any key cards to go up, Brendan? I mean, the Majestics are really interesting to me as well, right? The cards like Encase, um, you know, Freezing Point. Like, these these cards are interesting. Sigil of Permafrost is a rare as a defense reaction. Mm-hmm. I talked about Absorbent Aether. Like, there is there is things to do there, and I think there's multiple ways to take this deck. Frost um, Hex. Peak. Right? Frost Hex just damage, right? Like, that's a permanent. Yeah, Frost it, yeah, really it is, it is, it is. But you do have to obviously, you know, it, like, is that a value permanent, or is that like a setup permanent? That's what I'm interested to see. Like, is that something that's just going to kill people over the, the sort of the... The stages of the game, or is that something you're actually trying to set up with multiple frost hexes and like ice eternal? So I think you're trying to set it up, and here's why: is because like you have to change the way that you're playing that card for it to actually be effective, right? Because your opponent's breaking the fr- the frost bites on their turn. If you give them on your turn, you're usually trying to tax them after the first attack, so that you know you can stop them from blasting you. And in all those cases, they don't get left with any frostbites at the end of the turn. It's actually really low value when they do get left with frostbites in the turn because they just blow up. So I think you're trying to stack like three of them and then play things like Ice Eternal, then play something that's like this critical maximum of frostbites where they just like they can't clear them. They can't getting, break it on their turn. Exactly. They're getting blown up, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think it's well, a they value play one card, right? Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. like that's, that's sort of the summary of that is I don't think that uh, Frost X is a value card. Cool. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, right. You maybe you uh, incarceration them on your turn, whatever. They get three frost bites, and then they can break one of it by playing something. But then all of a sudden, you just go, okay, well, I'll take that attack, and here's an ice eternal out of arsenal, and now you can't play anything else for the rest of your turn, and these are going to blow up in your face. Yeah, that, do, that seems do you like play e plus with ice eternal too? Like, are you just because <sighs> if you have three frost taxes and you're black, I mean, it's E-plus pretty hot. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the the last card I did want to talk about though is Coronet Peak. That that card. The legendary headpiece is super interesting to me. So pay three and then target opponent discards a card unless they um, pay a resource, right? It does. It is an action. Is so, an action. you you know, it does cost your action point. But what is really interesting about that is to me is like you can kind of... Because what my issue I have with like Icelander is you need part of, one half of your deck and the other half of your deck to come together to work well. So the ice half of your deck and the action half of your deck that deals damage. And some of these are one and the same. You have like Ice Bolt and stuff. But how many of these kind of middling cards can you play as opposed to like powerful cards, you know, your disruption and then your damage? Like where does that come together? And one of the cool things I do like about Coronet Peak is defend with three cards, keep a blue, activate Coronet Peak to take a card on your opponent's turn. They disrupt them trying to play five card hands, four or five cards handed to you. Like that, that I think that card has some real strength to it, which is, uh, is really going to interest me in this format. Interesting. Yeah, Coronet Peak for me, and I think this could just be because I'm not smart enough, but it has, like I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, right? Like it's not, Coronet Peak is not the one that's like really gets me excited. There's a card called Insidious Chill, which looks mega annoying. Oh my god. It is. I've played against Unlimited. It sucks. Oh yeah. So I annoying. Got, I got one Unlimited, but like in Constructed, having three of those, like that card jesus christ so this is a this is a ice action aura so it comes on the board with three frost counters on it if there's no frost out counters on it you destroy it but it says whenever you ice fuse remove a frost counter from the insidious chill if you do target hero discards card unless they pay two that on a stick on a permanent oh and you can play it at an arsenal yeah. that card seems good man yeah it's it's a it's a real pain yeah that's why i think ice fan is also very good so yeah um it's going to be interesting to see where Icelander goes. I like, I agree. I think it's going to be, I think people are going to come prepared with some solid Icelander builds on week one. And um, I think they're going to, they're going to do okay. Like they're going to really crush some of these aggro decks. It's like a meta call to maybe people playing fire week one. And um, what, what that means is I probably think that, you know, uh, a deck like Alton probably does really well in week one. A deck like Prism does quite well in week one, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where we shake out uh what next brendan so this is my kind of last question for you i guess is where where are you starting with uprising what's your kind of first obviously you have this event coming up this week no uprising but then you know you've got some road to nationals coming up um what where are you starting with uprising how are you testing how are you going about evaluating and trying to build with this new set yeah so how am i testing um well, in terms of duration and times, it's the usual. So <laughs> pretty much every day. Five I just mean about how are you approaching yeah. this new format? Like, what yeah, are you how are we approaching it? So we're going to verify the old format, right? Like, so now Chain and Starvo are gone. It's like, let's reevaluate what people think are good, right? Old, they think Old Time's good, Prism's good, and Briar's good. Let's evaluate this deck. Let's see where the lists are. Let's see what the gauntlet is. Develop that. All right. Let's start brewing a bit, I guess, with the new heroes. Um, see what the community is talking about as well, and then start bringing in those old decks, bring in those uh, those dashes, potentially a Reinar. <laughs> One day he'll see he'll see the he'll see the light, um, and just go from there. I think that there's a big part of this is about exposure. Like you want to get exposed to a lot of the meta before you go to a road to nationals and it slaps you in the face. Um, at the same time, I'm playing. I'm probably gonna play almost all limited road to nationals. That's just how it kind of rolls down where I am. 
the that's cool they have yeah the, the the limited ones and the and the classic constructed ones tend to be on the same weekend you kind of get to choose and i will be choosing limited <laughs> what about you um uh yeah i mean i'm just gonna start with some ideas got some brews kind of i shared some of them today right like this defensive icelander uh, the kind of draw my deck that really tries to abuse ghostly touch like these are the kind of you know a fire deck that's like rupture based or this kind of <clears throat> shuko based deck these are the things I'm just going to build up and start with, play a few games, see what's the inherent power of it, <clears throat> and then go back to the the old sort of gauntlet decks as well and kind of where we are post the format, just things I talked about. Um, for me, I mean, I'm going to play a mix of Road to Nationals, some Limited, some Constructed, going to just, just try and play games <clears throat> before the Pro Tour. That's kind of my goal. Um, and yeah, just try and evaluate where we are with this format, try and find a few fun things. I guess last quick question for you though, Brendan, is um, on, a, on a scale of Bolton to Briar, uh, how impactful are these three new heroes in the format? If you could, uh, if you could rank them, which uh, which ones are going to have the most impact, and which ones are going to have Bolton esque, maybe less less impact? Yeah, sorry, Bolton. Jermai, Ryer, by Bolton, um, Icelander, probably Bolton, just because uh, I don't see it really beating up on Oldham. I think Oldham is going to be really prevalent. Um, that's a total guess. Don't hold me to it. I know you. What did you, you put five? I put I put five to Bolton. He's a Bolton. Oh, yeah, Bolton the Bolton yeah. boys. I know the Bolton boys hate me, um, and that's why they exist as the uh, sort of. The, they do. They told me. They, yeah. yeah, they exist as the baseline of our spectrum. They are literally the bottom. Bolton is the lowest you can go. Um, but still, I think that yeah. If, I, if I'm gonna do something that's even slightly controversial, it's Dramai, uh, Briar, and then Icelander and Fi at uh, at Bolton. Okay, cool. Should we uh, close it up for the week? I think you've got a Google review for us, Brendan, before we wrap up. Yeah, we do have a Google review. Um, it is from Pierre. Uh, last name, don't know if I can I can hit that one right now, but he says, uh, I'd like to you want me to try? You can try. Do the whole thing. Uh, Pierre Henry de Sardines? I don't know. It's maybe. Give maybe. it a go. <laughs> Sorry if we messed that one up. Um, so I like to uh, he says I like to consider myself to be a, the little annoying brother of Hayden Dale and Brennan Patrick, constantly mimicking my older si siblings as I try to figure out how they do how they do the things they do. What do I mean by that? Well, Hayden won a skirmish using Reiner, so I modeled my Reiner deck after his and finally placed first at my first ever Blitz Armory event. Brennan and the boys brought Kana to the Pro Tour, and I started to pick up some of the pick up some of the cooler lines and managed to unlock a 41 damage turn while presented with Lethal at one health myself. Listening to this podcast is such a joy every week, and I look forward to all the tips, insights, and occasional banter that my oldest brothers at Arsenal Pass never cease to deliver. As the saying goes, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Hopefully, Brendan and Hayden, uh, you read this and feel flattered indeed. Keep up the incredible work. I hope to see you both someday at a fab event, or better yet, be matched against Brendan by my Jeb, so I can try, so I can cry softly as he licks his fingers, knowing the battle is already over and he has won. Well, thank you, Pierre. <laughs> Hayden, so yeah. if people want to get fe a feature on Arsenal Pass and get their review read, how do they do it? Uh, well, first of all, they need to roast you a bit more. We was the, I was waiting for the Brendan roast to come in. It never came, so I don't know what's going on there. Definitely but, don't. Um, wait, let's let's switch it up. Why don't we roast Hayden for once? Sure. Like, look at Go this on. guy. This guy, I think that he's he's ready for roasting, and his tolerance is uh, he's got plenty of it because it's never happened. <laughs> Uh, you can get your reviews in by going to ratethispodcast.com forward slash Arsenal Pass and uh, dropping us a review for your preferred streaming platform um and yeah please please do we we love getting reviews it helps us get out to to more people in the community and uh, maybe those who know about flesh and blood but don't necessarily know a lot about it scrolling through and, and come across you know our reviews and and the podcast so and of course it gives us a little kick as well so thank you all uh that's it for uprising class constructed and i guess a, a first look an early build we will of course be revisiting the class constructor format the blitz format and definitely limited with uprising over the next four weeks as we hurdle through this road to national season very exciting uh, you know, this this year's just going to fly, Brendan. We've got Road to National season. We've got Pro Tour number two. We've got Nationals uh, coming up. And then James White has confirmed that Worlds is happening in November uh, on the Instant Speed podcast with Flake this previous or this past week. So that is coming. We have got a lot of OP to round out the rest of the year. Finally, check us out on YouTube. Arsenal Pass on YouTube. We do a lot of, you know, uh, things like deck guides. Uh, we just did some limited videos. Uh, we will be getting back to some gameplay as well. Me and Brendan are trying to make our schedules work so we can do some gameplay. It does take a bit more sort of uh, effort and, and time availability for us to do those just because of production and, and things like that. Um, Twitter, 
Come and find us on Twitter. We're at uh, Brendan APG and Fian underscore Dale. Uh, engage in Fab Twitter, and, and you know we like to post a lot of things like deck lists, etc. And a big shout out to all of our patrons. Massive thank you uh, on up on our Patreon for Arsenal Pass. We do have all of the sideboard guides and deck guides that we post up for um, when we do a deck tech up on YouTube. So you get the full written guides up on our Patreon. We do an additional monthly podcast, uh, usually around sort of like level ups or things that we want to cover that uh, maybe a little bit off the beaten track that don't quite fit with the, the main pod as well. Um, or we don't have time to cover all of it. And we do sort of other things as well. Like we'll post up kind of like limited tier lists and things like that as we go through seasons. Um, and anything else we sometimes do gameplay reviews so otherwise brendan we'll see everyone next week well i was going to close it out with one more thing is that if you're interested in the fab fitness for july definitely stay tuned go check out the arsenal Please. pass patreon if you're a content creator and you're interested to join us we will feature you like we will we will give as much exposure as possible hit me up dm me let's make this work um so it's going to be coming in july we're going to create a little channel in the arsenal pass patreon discord you'll be able to talk in there yet yeah, you'll be able to see there july will unlock it and we'll give out plenty more details and we're going to see what kind of prizes we can raise i think we're going to get some exciting stuff specifically that very 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 limited edition life pad that i think there's only like two more left i might have to go try to find some more um but anyway hayden thank you everyone for listening and uh good luck at your upcoming events if you're in ohio come say hi to me um and yeah we'll see you in the next one yeah